Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairman, past presidents, colleagues, past presidents, ladies and gentlemen, the title of my last book, summarizing my time in office as president of the European Council, was Europe in the storm. And two years later, we are still in the midst of the storm. The rapid succession of crises of all kinds, what we call the, the multiple crises, those who studied Greek one day, the poly crisis. So the su rapid succession of all crises has provoked a deep shock, leaving wounds that are not yet healed. And some crises come from outside, banks, refugees, terrorism. Some come of came from within, the Eurozone, the economic crisis, Brexit. Trust, it's not a coincidence that I use this word also. Trust was broken or on the verge of being broken, not in elements of our society, but in pillars of our societies. Actually, banks and the currency are both based precisely on trust. And the refugee crisis created the perception, not always true, the perception, the fear that we will live one day in a world which would not really be ours anymore. We overcame both crises, but it takes time before trust is restored. Trust, famous Dutch idiom, trust goes away on a horseback and comes back by foot. But whatever the source of the crisis, citizens are asking for solutions from our national and our European authorities. Nevertheless, seen from a, a wider perspective, European integration has been a success story. I apologize of being positive. I apologize, it's not politically correct anymore, I know this. In these times of accumulating crisis, it is important to be aware of this. The European Union has guaranteed peace democracy and prosperity for its citizens and member states for almost 70 years, not 30 years, for 70 years. It is still the greatest political achievement in history that has served the people of our continent. The European Union and the Europeans themselves have turned the page of a tragic history by freeing ourselves from fascist and communist dictatorships. We have created a new image of Europe in the world, far removed from colonialism and imperialism. We have set up and we improved the single market, the biggest single market in the world of 500 million consumers with high purchasing power. And we enabled the free movement of people, of goods, of services, and capital among member states. We have created a common, a common currency, a currency union, and defended it amidst the challenges of a global economic and financial crisis. We have found our way back to economic growth since 2014 and fiscal consolidation in most of our member states. And furthermore, we have managed to attract many more member states, and there is still, still a waiting list of candidate countries. Ladies and gentlemen, we can be proud of these achievements. We should point them out more often, but we cannot take them for granted, and we should draw lessons from our mistakes. The Union is, of course, going through a difficult time at present as are our member states and their respective democracies. All the ideas which make up liberal democracy and secure social cohesion 
are being challenged in a new world full of all kinds of uncertainties. But let us have a look at our economies. Although the political agenda of people and of leaders shifted last year, it's all about security, migration, terrorism. The economy, nevertheless, remains crucial for our prosperity. And let us not forget that unemployment and inequalities are the main drivers of populism in Southern Europe. As I just said, we cannot take our achievements for granted. And the euro, the euro is a good example. You can't have a common currency without a banking union, an economic union, and a fiscal union. We are still at the stage of drawing all the conclusions of this essential step, abandoning national currencies. Unfortunately, no progress was made since 2014. It is not an ideological discussion between federalists and intergovernmentalists. It is just fearing to take the unavoidable decisions, the unavoidable responsibilities, implying more solidarity and more integration. Unfortunately, we take too often those kinds of decisions in a crisis in front of the abyss, a cliff edge situation, as it is now called in the Brexit debate. We still lack the necessary tools to face another unknown crisis. We don't know at what time. We don't know what kind of crisis. But it will happen in the future. And we are all fully aware of this. But knowing the good is not the same as doing the right thing. Knowledge and action are separated as Socrates taught us 2,500 years ago. The biggest threat to the Eurozone is not economic, but political. Going from political instability and party fragmentation to the growing influence of populism and populist parties. It creates either weak governance, not capable of reform and courageous measures, and it creates parties to do the opposite of what is needed. The Eurozone requests convergence of policies. Divergence undermine a monetary union. And populism would create those divergences. Ladies and gentlemen, a member of the Eurozone cannot leave it, the Eurozone, without a very high price. And that's why the UK can leave the EU more more easily than a Eurozone country. The Euro was and is a great political project, unifying the continent more than the single market. But at the same time, its crisis between 2010 and 2013 has made the European idea less attractive. The single market, the single market was a win-win operation. But on the other hand, the single currency brought the European idea via the wallet into people's daily lives, but in a negative way, due to the crisis in the euro area. The single currency created winners and losers. The single market, I recall, was more a win-win operation. And we need now to restore cohesion but not the artificial cohesion based on huge public and private debts, as in the period before the banking crisis. Debts, public and private, have masked imbalances and uneven developments inside the euro area. Debts have created an artificial and unsustainable economic growth. We are making progress the last years in terms of convergence in fields such as inflation, 
balance of payments, public deficits, and even on growth and jobs. Actually, we are creating 5 million, 5 million jobs in the euro area between 2014 and 2017. Again, I apologize for this good news. Because the main threat to the eurozone is political, we must maneuver cautiously also in domains such as public deficits and public debts, or as it is called, austerity. The direction is, in my point of view, more important than the speed. Too much economic and fiscal discipline can kill political discipline. Of course, the 3% target remains an absolute necessity. We have to take into, a go, uh, into, uh, into account each time the global picture. I don't belong to the club of those who fear the implosion of the union. Brexit and the chaos it produces is not an incentive to provoke other exits. The confidence in the EU membership increased dramatically in almost all our countries, in the, on almost all the 27, after June 23. The problems of the UK have yet to start. The American presidential elections dealt with the same problems as we are used to in Europe. Migration, terrorism, insecurity, globalization, opposition to the so-called elites. And this shows that our root problems are not only related to the European Union or to the national democracies. It is a Western-wide challenge. Our growing inwards-looking behavior prevents us from seeing this broader picture. A lack of self-confidence is hampering lucidity on our own situation in Europe. Day by day, it becomes clear what the big challenge for the upcoming years and decades really is. How to keep our societies, our democracies, our economies open, and at the same time, how to better protect people against the excesses of this openness. How to better protect people against financial instability, unemployment, unsecured jobs, irregular migration, climate change, social, commercial, and fiscal dumping, huge inequalities. How to do this? We need, ladies and gentlemen, a new balance between freedom, fairness, and protection. The simple truth is that we cannot provide results in these domains without more European cooperation and more European integration. It is a, a Europe of the necessary. It is not an ideological choice. Actually, it's not a choice at all. It is an unavoidable consequence of previous choices and of the political agenda of large parts of our citizens. Of course, this Europe will request more transfer of sovereignty and more solidarity, more cooperation, as was mentioned in another speech this evening. But in fact, we are not sovereign anymore on migration, on terrorism, on dumping, etc. More European cooperation and integration will give us more control over our destiny, again using a Brexit idiom. It reminds me that by giving up Belgian monetary sovereignty, the Belgian franc, we won control back. Our national currency was totally dependent on the Dutch mark, and the euro gave us a seat in the European Central Bank. We won in terms of sovereignty by losing our national currency. We were for too long in Europe in a survival mode, first with the Eurozone and later with the Schengen Zone. We decided on longer-term reforms, but this time, it is time to have a strategic view. 
of the European Union. The European Council and the European Commission launched ideas already in 2014, I remember well. But after the Brexit referendum and the American elections, it is time to act. We have to seize the opportunity because both events, Brexit and American elections, create a vacuum which the Union can fill. A strategic plan waits for an opportunity to get it implemented. The less the time is ripe, the more we have to do to make it ripe. The famous British philosopher Jeremy Bentham said this more than 200 years ago. A really new chapter for more European cooperation is the military one. The Russian threat and Americans' reluctance to have as much solidarity as in the past is giving a push to the military, di military dimension of the Union. We have to go on with the free trade agreement, free and fair trade. By the way, the America First philosophy is actually one on folding back on itself. And it is contradictory with the other slogan, make America great again. The dropping of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, this big agreement, this big trade agreement with 12 countries, the United States, Japan, and, and Latin American and Asian countries. So this, the dropping of this TPP in Asia means a considerable loss of influence of the US in the Far East. It was in the name of America first that the TPP is dropped. But of course, when, they, when you lose influence, you don't make, you doesn't make America great again. The Union must conclude the negotiations with Japan next year, and we are underway. The agreement with Vietnam is already finalized. We have to go on with the talks with Indonesia. Korea and Singapore are already strong trading partners with whom we have a very, a very well functioning trade deals. But also in South America, we have agreements as a union in the pipeline, namely with Brazil and Argentina, after our trade deals with Peru, with Ecuador and Colombia. The union has to remain open because it is a source of growth and jobs and influence in the world. I fear that the protectionist cause of the new American administration will jeopardize the so-called TTIP agreement between the EU and the United States. It had the potential of the, to be the biggest trade and investment agreement ever, setting standards for the other half of the world economy. Hope is still a verb, and optimism is a moral duty. But our internal trade, our single market, has also got to be strengthened. Free movement of goods, services, capital and people is not enough. We have to add a chapter on, on industrial policy, on microeconomic policy, creating an energy and a digital union. Our market is too fragmented and too dependent, respectively, on Russia and on a few American companies. We made progress during the last years in terms of energy and digital union, but starting with a huge lag. Competitiveness remains key. Consolidation at the level of enterprises is inevitable on a European scale. The time of national champions should be over. Unfortunately, we notice that these old-fashioned reactions are still uh, valid every day. In the financial sector, we, we also need consolidation in order to remain competitive vis-a-vis -vis American and Chinese competitors. Another lesson I draw from Brexit and the American elections is about jobs. And we have to reflect on the simple fact that two countries, the UK and the US, both with very low unemployment rates, 5%, full employment, nevertheless still face a very low level of social harmony and contentment, such that their societies are growing more polar polarized and more aggressive not only politically, but also socially. Even those who have a job, 
fear they may lose it any day. And many of the low and lower middle class have resigned themselves to lower wages. And one third of them in the, EU, in the EU and the US feels that their standard of living is declining in the last five years. The motto, it's the economy, stupid, is no longer entirely true. In climate change, we can become world leaders in the clean energy transition. But other players like China are catching up. This transition is the growth factor of the future. And the EU is well placed to use our R&D and our innovative policy, innovation policies to turn it into a concrete industrial opportunity. The climate skepticism of the incoming American administration is again an opportunity for Europeans to go ahead with our climate goals. And by the way, we will overperform by doing better in 2020 than the target of minus 20% greenhouse gas emissions. And the new objective of minus 40% in 2030 is within reach. The union, by the way, spoke with one voice at the COP21 conference in Paris. They spoke with one voice on the most important team for the human race. We shouldn't be too humble. Another area where we shouldn't miss the train is Africa. We donated a lot in the past. We opened our markets for African countries. China is on the rise in Africa. We have to react. The Commission is fully aware of investment possibilities and is setting up instruments. If we want to contain migration coming from this populous neighboring continent, we have to offer them something in exchange. Africa's share of the global population is expected to grow from 16% 60, in 2015 to 25 in 2050 and 39% of the world population by the end of this century. So financing concrete investments, also attractive private capital where possible, needs to become a priority. The biggest danger of neo-nationalism and populism is a bunker mentality or a fortress mindset. The paradox is that we have to remain open-minded in order to defend our interests and our identity. The biggest enemy always is fear. It's precisely anxiety which is at the source of irrationality and even decisions going against the long-term interests of our people, our nations, and of Europe as a whole. I repeat, this openness has to go, go, in, to go hand in hand with protecting our citizens, protecting them better against unfair and undesirable evolutions. It can be this combination of openness and protection. It can be our our new narrative for the years to come. A mix of an offensive and defensive, but in any case, a narrative of hope. And let's hope that after the elections of 2017, a new initiative is taken to redynamize the European Union. I prefer to use this verb instead of reinvent. It would mean a new, new treaty and the last one took eight years to negotiate, let us invest our time and energy on other issues. But we need more than deeds. We have to change also our language about the European Union. Brussels is and was a symbol of some kind of a negative Europe, imposing sacrifices and efforts on people. Even the name of Brussels is a, symbol of, is a symbol of a Europe after the glorious days of the win-win when Europe was not yet affecting our daily lives. And as I said, this perception changed dramatically with the introduction of the Euro. The Union is mature now. It is no longer a love affair of young people. We are in a marriage with its ups and downs with the 27, for better and for worse. 
we have to fight for our marriage. Love is a verb. One country is in the process of divorce. Let's hope we can achieve a, an amicable divorce by mutual consent. Until now, this is not sure, but let's hope. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, defending Europe is not only a responsibility for politicians, for leaders. It is a collective responsibility. Civil society has a key role to play, also because its credibility is often higher than that of political leaders. Organization as yours, Accountancy Europe, acknowledges more than others how indispensable Europe became, even if we are not always agreeing on issues close to our daily business. We cannot longer imagine a world without the European Union. We have to draw all the consequences of this choice. And by the way, the European Union and your organization, Accountancy Europe, are sharing the same, the same values of transparency, of accountability, of trust, being at the service of the general interest. And we know also at the level of the EU, this is an ongoing process. And I presume it is also your daily challenge. The truth, the bigger picture, is always a reflection of light and shadow of positive and negative elements. If we overemphasize the shadow, we shouldn't be surprised that one day exit talks prevail. At the same time, it will be too, at that time, it will be too late. And it will be too late to say that is not what we were aiming for. I advocate an open view on the EU, open with its pros and its cons. I saw this afternoon the result of an opinion poll on the statement, you, you feel, do you feel, do you feel yourself as a citizen of the EU? That was the statement. Do you feel as a citizen of the EU? And in the age group of 15, until 24, on average in the EU, 77% said yes, 15 points more than my generation, and 18 points more than those born during the war. And among students, it is even 83%. One has noticed, by the way, the same tendencies in the Brexit referendum. So I end this speech on this hopeful message. And again, I apologize to be a man of hope. Thank you.